And speaking on the projects you've done, like I said, we've touched on Music City Center, Mount Zion, Baptist Church, um, the African American Museum, right? This is a project, I guess it's been I'm here almost three, four years now? It's been here, it opened 2021. 2021, so, okay, yeah, so. right after COVID. Um, how excited were you to be brought on to help with that job? How, you I know? Was, was very elated, and, uh, and looking back, uh, KB, I was elated to be part of the evolution of the National Museum of African American yeah, I was about to ask, was there any backstories? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so, so um, um, a group of, a small group of people, uh, Dr. T.B. Boyd and, and, um, um, and a few others, uh, Francis Guest, mm -hmm. those two guys were the pioneers for saying, I think it, as, as the story goes, Francis Guest um, served on the, the, the uh, chamber board. I think he was chairman of the chamber, okay. natural, natural chamber, uh, before there were any other offsprings of chambers. He was, he was one of the, the chairman of the chamber, and he noted that there, there are no African-American museums that tells the stories of African-Americans in Nashville. Mm -hmm. Apparently there's one in, in Chattanooga, there's one in Knoxville, the Beck Cultural Center. Right. There's a couple in Memphis, right. but of the four big cities, Nashville didn't have any, have any in representation. So he set out to have a, a national, and it, and it started out being, it, the name changed a couple of times. I remember it was the Museum of African-American History and Culture. Af Museum of Af African American Art, History, and Culture. Okay. It, was gonna, it was gonna be Maymac, I remember. So, uh, and, and then a lot of people had an issue with that. I mean, we would get critique, even my church member, who was one of the Freedom Riders, I remember him pulling me to the side and saying, that doesn't make sense, the name is too much, it's too big, and this and that and that other. And uh, so that was like back in 2000. The, the museum has been trying to get built for like 20 years or so, 22 wow. years. I, I was hired, and I, they signed my contract in 2008. So what, what made it finally get off the ground? Well, um, a lot of things. A lot of it, it touched a lot of hands. Uh, you can credit it. You know, you can credit Paula Roberts for taking it. She was exec, executive director for a while. You can credit her for taking it to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. Then Henry Hicks, um, he pretty much took it over across the finish line. Uh, but I think it, it was a hard work of a lot of people to get it to that point. Uh, in fact, uh, many people uh, we remember when it was going to be on Jefferson Street. Oh, so right now, Street? yeah, it was going to be okay. right now where the the uh, the uh, Tennessee Museum, the Tennessee State Museum is. That's where it was going to be. Uh, okay. And so that That's was the state's pro property. The state was going to lease the property to the National Museum of African American Music. By the way, um, a study was done by a company called Lord, Lord Cultural. Lord Cultural, Cultural was uh, a firm that did a lot of studies on museums, and they would, after the, their findings, would tell you what kind of museum they recommend that you build, right? Mm -hmm. And so their study said, hey, Nashville is a lot of music in Nashville. You should build a museum that's based on music. music right. And so they dropped the art and culture and they just started to focus on music. music. And at some point, I can't remember exactly, but I think it became, Paula Roberts can be credited for making sure that the connotation national museum. So it was a museum of African American music, but she was, she pushed for it to get the connotation of national museum of African American music. And, and then uh, at some point, Henry Hicks, uh, he was a board member and he stepped in to be the, the uh, president and executive director per se, and, uh, and grew it from there. But Carl Dean, when he built, after the Music City Center was built, there's a lot of, a lot of intertwining kind of right. stories. Back and forth. When the Music City Center was built, we had an old convention center, and, and, and everybody was trying to figure out, okay, what do we do with that? So um, that's when Carl Dean decided to, he's going to put an RFP out for a developer to come in and determine uh, what could be there on Fifth and Broadway. And, uh, and so um, uh, he reached out to the museum people, the National Museum of African American Music team, and said, would you consider having the museum downtown as opposed to having it on Jefferson Street? And if you do that, we'll give you a, a you know, lease, uh, uh, free lease, basically free lease for 70 years. Whew. So that helps, so uh, a museum, you know, they, they, need, they need any help they can get because right. it takes a lot to keep museum doors open. 
And it made sense because not only are you getting, you know, free, a free rent, you have to pay common area maintenance though, but you're mm -hmm. getting free rent and you're able to sustain it. But you also, the idea was you get a, the visitorship of all the people going Coming to business in. stuff downtown. Yeah. And, uh, and so that's kind of how it ended up being where it is now. Yeah. And you being a native of Nashville and, you know, this being known as Music City, something like the African American Museum of, of, of Music History could have easily been lost, right? Sure. Everybody yeah. could have just been focused on, okay, it's Music City, Nashville, it's Broadway, it's just one particular mm -hmm. area of just music. But for them to put that, especially downtown where people, when they do come, majority go. So they have to pass it. Now right, right, going, right. At least gives them a chance and to go it, check it out. It gives them know. a chance to check it out. People here for conferences. And if they hadn't heard of it, they walk by it and said, at least either they may see it then mm -hmm. or they may come back and say, hey, I got to come back and maybe right. they'll bring their family. So definitely the presence there uh, helps. Um, also, um, definitely it, it helps to tell the story. You and I know we're natives right. um, that there's more going on in the city than country music. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, country music probably puts a lot of food on our tables, right? Whether it's indirect or direct. Right. You know, it, it, money generated is, is hitting us some kind of way. So we can't strictly we can't, off we can't turn our backs on that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, culturally, it's a lot more going on. And, and, and so I think the National Museum of African American Music is, is a catalyst for helping to change that perception. Once they see the museum, they get to understand all these other things that are going on. They get to understand the influence that Fisk University's had on music with the with Fisk Jubilee, Jubilee Singers, Singers and the name of this and arguably the name of Music City. They get to understand what TSU contributes. Uh, they get to understand uh, even the American Baptist College, you know, how that fits into the equation, you right. know, and, and the John Lewis and, and all these things and the sit-ins and all. It causes us to look at everything because when you talk music, now every part of everybody's story has a, a soundtrack. You know, we write we write and we know how to write music to every problem, blues, right. happiness, mm. um, ups and downs or whatever, jubilation, you know, so it can touch a little bit of everything as far as people's lives and, and back to music. Yeah, that was good for them to put it there, man. I remember when I yeah. first saw it, uh, when it was getting built, mm -hmm. I was like, man, they're going to put it downtown? Oh, that's pretty neat. You yeah. know, to actually go in, it's... The work on it is fantastic. Uh, yeah. You know, if you haven't been to it, you know, if you do live in Nashville, you don't live in Nashville, definitely one of the top places to come and visit. I mean, it's, it's beautiful how it's done. The the details of each person, whether it's instruments or a person that's talking about, I mean, it was, mm -hmm. it was so to be a native of Nashville, I know that makes you feel good to actually see something like that put out there to the public for people to check out. Definitely, um, so definitely. now the, the new big thing, of course, you know, it's a lot of, I'm sure there's no, I'm um, sure there'll be some updates and news about the football stadium. Yes. And, you know, every big city. I knew this was coming. Because I Excited about um, it. Growing up in Atlanta when I was young, I remember when the Olympics came in 96. I remember how they redid almost all downtown just for parking and hotels. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the next thing was the Phillips Arena and the Super Bowl was coming to town. Yes. And it was all within a span of three years. Mm -hmm. And um, so when I saw all these hotels getting built, I said, yeah, they're trying to get the Super Bowl. But of course, we knew the problem was going to be with an open stadium, the mm -hmm. weather down here. You can't predict, predict what it's going to be in February. Right. So how do you think the new football stadium being built, how do you think that would impact Nashville, so to speak? You know, it's, it's, it's going to impact Nashville in a great way. We've all, it's already been proven that we like football. Right. It's already been proven that we support the Titans and, and um and we, we're, we're learning to be a good fan, right? So um, we're, we're trying to leave the idea of being a fair weather fan when, they, <laughs> when we support them, when they win. We're learning to be able to um, be, in the, be in the, down in the dumps a bit when, when they lose. So when they win, we can kind of appreciate it. So we really have, since 90, I think the Titans moved here in like 98, mm -hmm. nine, somewhere in there. So we've had some time to really become a, a good sports fan sports. with the Titans. So, right. um, and I was driving by the other day, and I, I, in fact, on Friday, I was talking to some guys who are from, they're from Chicago, and the, you know, because they're, they're out there in Soldier Field, and they think that our stadium is pretty good. And I'm thinking the one we have, they think it's pretty cool, but I'm thinking, you know, I told them you can't really see all the, 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 uh, the deterioration around mm -hmm. the leaks that we hear all the time about the building. 
And I'm driving yesterday thinking about this, and I remember thinking the Titans deserve to have uh, a great place to play. Right. And, and so, you know, there's an argument, you know, for and against. And anytime you have, you know, you have an all-star group or, or a professional team, you, they, if you want them to be successful and you want them to, to match up with any place in the world, it's just like um, your, your mom sending you out to school and all the other kids got, you know, a, a nice fresh polo shirts and, <laughs> and khakis or whatever the, the uniform requires. And here you come in, in some stuff that, you know, somebody you handed you down two right. years ago. <laughs> and it's, you know, it, you wash it and you wash it a hundred times. You can see the dinge in it or whatever. You can see the imperfections in it. And you deserve to have the nice same stuff that your colleagues have that you got to deal with every day if you can. And, and so... And so I think that that's that's kind of that's kind of sums it up for me um, that the Titans deserve to have a great place to play, so we can rally behind them. So it can it can be part of the health of our city. Now, should they involve our citizens and our vendors and here locally? Absolutely, it's important that that they give money back, and the, and the Titans do that. You know, I, I, fortunately for me, um, we were hired to help the Titans on the diversity and inclusion part, as right. well as helping to manage the stadium to get built. We were part of that team as well. And I see firsthand, if I, if I even thought I was critical of the Titans, I see firsthand that they Our are genuine. Being done. Yeah, they're genuine about um, what, they, what they're trying to do in the community. They're truly genuine. And, uh, and, and every person at the Titans you, that, I, that you talk to, you'll find them to be the same, no matter where you meet them, when, when, they're, when they're talking in public or in private. Um, they're gonna give back to the community. They, we wanna give to them so they can definitely Pour give back, back to the community. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when that happens, all the things like the Super Bowl, and, and I think that as a town, we just need to pay attention to what the other cities did. Because everybody else is elevated. Exactly, yeah. so mom and pop shops, you know, Friends who own restaurants and services and transportation services, we have we all have people who do that. We need to say, here's what you guys need to do to get ready for the Super Bowl when it comes, or big events, or when they have concerts in there. How, how do how do our vendors get ready, right. and so they're not sitting back, pointing and, and watching somebody else get mm -hmm. well off? How do we get in there? Yeah, because it can so change I, your life or your business. It can change your like life. That. And it should. Yeah. It should change the life for a lot of businesses. So I think instead of us sitting back, you know, watching it happen, you know, that whole three things, three different kinds of people, one who, um, one who uh, makes things happen, mm -hmm. one who watches it happen, and wonder, and those who wonder what happened. We gotta be one of them that <laughs> makes it happen, makes it right? Happen, and right. so if we get into that mindset to make it happen, then we can take advantage of the, the the overspill is going to come from the Titan Stadium getting built. Yeah, yeah. I always I think that's important, man. And then you know cities grow and time goes by. Like we've been yeah. here for a long time, so we knew. You know, you, of course, your city wants to host the Super Bowl. Who, who sure. wouldn't want to host the yeah. Super Bowl? But you got to do things in order to put it in place so it can happen. Um, dealing with you know the big news of, about TSU and all this money. We're not going to get into the details of it, but. From a landscape perspective, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if, if everything goes right, gets funneled in uh, the right way, and then gets put out to the right places, do you see TSU as a as a campus that can be a model campus for a lot of HBCUs in the South? As far as I mean, because the the land we have and and how much land we own is beautiful. You know, it's a big mm -hmm. campus. If I've been to a lot of other campuses. Now, you know, HBCUs and other other schools, period. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, our campus is beautiful how it's laid out. So do you think, hopefully here in the next five, ten years, do you see a, a, a it should be a big upgrade? And do they have a chance to be like a model campus for a lot of other Yeah, universities? absolutely. There's, there's no reason why we can't. Um, you touched on something because um, I'm not the only one who's seen your project back when I was in school. Me and my cop, my roommate, a guy named German White from Chicago, we uh, teamed up on our capstone project, okay. and it was to develop uh, the, the the land over near the, the river off, uh, on TSU's campus. Hmm. And every time I talk to another, you know, uh, colleague who's came, who's come out of school since we came out, they had a similar senior project. 
So the concept and the idea and the vision has always been there, even at, even from a student perspective. Mm -hmm. But how do we, how does that translate to the leadership? How does the leadership of TSU back then and, you know, past and present, how do they really enact the vision of, of developing the campus as they should? How do they, how do you put things in place? How do you yeah. create a master plan and then slowly, methodically get stuff done? Mm -hmm. and, and so, um, you know, we have to look within, our, we have to look within ourselves to get that done. Yeah. And we can't wait till, to somebody, you know, state, board of regents or whatever. Makes we can't wait, wait to the, for somebody else to come and say, hey, why aren't, haven't y'all done this? I know it's controversial to say, but I think that I'd like to see TSU uh, always be in the in front running on on our vision and and mm -hmm. and, put, and laying our vision out. And so and so when you know, ten years from now, we won't be talking about uh, why isn't the campus expanded? And, right. and you just laid out potential potentially it can be the you know one of the most beautiful campuses yeah. around. Mm -hmm. It it kind of it it already is to a sense, but that's that's untouched beauty. Right. We got land that's laying there mm -hmm. and not being developed. And how do we, how do we um, how do we manipulate and and capitalize on on opportunities? And I see a lot of corporate dollars coming to TSU, but I think that um, in order for for the longer range plan to be laid out and the shorter term plans get ex get executed, yeah. I think that's the key. It's like in the first four years, this has got to get done, mm -hmm. and we check the box. But but I don't think we've seen that happen in a few years. Yeah, ho hopefully, you know, I, I, I believe I got faith. So yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, yeah. we'll be able to look back, you know, five, ten years from now yeah. and see, you know, not a finishing job, but you mm -hmm. know, some progress going. Yeah, and um, I think maybe it's just a wake. It's a wake up call we yeah, have. Yeah. Okay, you know, all right, you know, time to vote called, and get it won't together. Get called again, right? So. Um, Seeing how Nashville is and, and seeing the growth of the city where it's going to, do you see a place for African Americans as a whole, whether it's business or personally, to have a place in this city five, ten years from now? Um, definitely. I think, uh, you know, old school statement, each one, teach one. We definitely have to communicate. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to say, and you'll, you guys will hear more about it, is there's about eight or nine of us business owners that have come together and we're going to pursue doing development. And, um, you know, we'd, lo we'd love to start some of the projects on the East Bank okay. that's coming up, but also other things in the city. And I think that around the living rooms, around the places you hang out with your friends, mm -hmm. we all sit around and talk about what ifs, but nobody really, uh, we don't do a good job at really, Putting you know, the word. Like put, putting it together. We say, man, we, you know, I've been saying I, we, we, we should have a club back when I was in college, you know, <laughs> not that I want to be a club owner, right. but the whole concept of us doing something together for us, I think, you know, we're going to be doing that. And I think that once you see a group doing that, we hope that the group of us who are going to do that, you're going to see, you're going to hear about it soon. I'll tell you the, the organization is called SEP, okay. Collective Equity Partners. You're going to hear more about the, that group and hopefully people will see that group doing stuff and they would say, wow, we want to do it too. Mm -hmm. So the next generations can keep doing that. So I think it, it has to be a lot of collective efforts. It has to be a lot of uh, putting money back into our, ourselves, you know what I'm saying, in order for the younger ones to grow. You know what I'm saying? I'm, 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 I'm not going to retire tomorrow, but, you know, I got to be thinking about it. Right. But at the same time, even in this, in, in here where I work, I'm trying to pass the ball to a couple of younger guys and, uh, and and let them take it where they need to take it. Yeah, and then most importantly, man, a lot of people just got to work well together, too. You Absolutely. Know, I, I think, you know, competition is good, you know, especially if it makes you go above whatever your potential may be, you know. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it does take people. That's how this country was built. That's how neighborhood, that's how a lot of things are able to get done. People work well together. Right, you Absolutely. Know, so that's one of the most important things. So that, that, that most definitely can happen. Through all the work and everything you've done over the years and that you will do in the future, what would you say were some of your major accomplishments? Um, first, uh, being married to uh, Tracy Kirk Harden for okay. 30, almost 33 years. Congratulations. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a major accomplishment. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't have done a lot of things that I've done without her because 
uh, when I was work, working with Floor, we were married then, and Floor would say, hey, we're going to send you to, you know, some other project. Mm -hmm. You can either go to Jackson, or you can go to Alabama, which one you want to do, and I would always involve her, and, and she would, you know, be willing to go where, where my career led. She right. could have chose a career uh, herself, but she chose to support what, we're, what I'm doing, so definitely uh, sincerely recognize her for that. Uh, and then, of course, I'm proud to have raised a son to, to be 29, almost 29 years old. Um, and, but now back to projects, having said all that, um, the National Museum of African American Music was a project that somebody allowed uh, me to lead a team of different people that look like us mm. to do what they do. So why that's important is because uh, if you practice to be a surgeon and uh, you know you become the best skilled at it and nobody really ever hires you to, to uh, let you do that, like hey we got you know uh, we got a really tricky patient that he has some kind of situation that you know you need a special surgeon to do that right. and they have to go fly him from from Italy somewhere because they don't, they, they overlook the talent they have here. So whenever somebody gives you the talent, gives you the opportunity to do what you're talented at mm -hmm. and say, you, and say uh, you know, it's up to you. I, I, I ran over a picture recently, uh, KB, where it, um, it was a groundbreaking of Megan Berry, uh, who's mayor at the time, uh, Henry Hicks, um, uh, TB Boy, who was okay. one of the visionaries of the project, Kevin Lavender, they were all downtown breaking ground. They had a big ceremony. And nothing was more special to me than, than Henry saying, Don, now go build our museum. Just like that. Mm -hmm. And it was like, okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it wasn't, to me, it wasn't, a, it wasn't like a, oh, I'm overwhelmed. It wasn't a fearful thing. It was like, man, I'm glad you said that. It's like somebody telling the chef, go cook. Go cook them a, mm -hmm. the best meal they can. He was ready to do it. And that's why uh, a lot of other projects, when we win a project with a bigger company, mm -hmm. it's like we're fighting to show them what we can do all the time, right? But on the Museum of Afri National Museum of African American Music, we were able to pull a team with architects, um, exhibit designers, fabricators, uh, you know, different trades and different professionals, and we managed them out of. Out, I, I, I brought, I raised, uh, uh, brought in a couple of people, like a project manager from TSU, okay. and a young lady from UTC. You know, they, you know, the black team. You know, black kids, and trained them on it. And now you can just let them do what they do now. Mm. So that was like that was a project that not only did they let let me do what what I do, but I was able to groom some other people to now they can do it. So. Mm. That's very important. Yeah. Um, what haven't you done yet but look forward to accomplishing in the future? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, I think th this athletics is a great opportunity. Uh, doing, doing the Titan Stadium, being That's a part of that, cool. being part of more of that, more athletics is going to be a really important. A lot of cultural stuff still has to get built in Nashville. Uh, would love to be part of the transit. I think... Uh, because we have a, we have a bit of transit experience, uh, we did we helped out with MARTA in Atlanta, uh, so I would love to see some of like some of those things, uh, some of the important things that need to be done in the city. I think I would like to be a part of that. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Um, seeing that you know you've done real good in your field all the way, you know, in college and even after college, if there was a young person looking for advice in your field, what would you give them? What would you tell them, you know, if they look for any advice that they were working in your field? I would tell them to um, study, learn the field as much as possible. Um, don't be afraid to, to go in places that, you know, don't be afraid to get on, uh, uh, get dirty. Don't, don't be afraid to get their get hands, hands dirty. dirty. And, uh, and don't be afraid to talk to anybody from the, from the highest level, you know, from the CEO to the mm -hmm. ditch, ditch digger. Don't be afraid to communicate uh, and learn from all, from all those different professionals. Gotcha. Spoke of, even with the National uh, Musical Museum, even mm -hmm. spoke about having to groom, you know, young kids that are in college and groom them, young black people working in your field, to groom them to do bigger projects. How important is that to you? And 
What do you think people like you have on the impact on that? I think, uh, you know, interesting you say, when I was in at TSU, mm -hmm. there was, of course, different organizations, NSBE, National Society of Black Engineers, but there was also, in my field, National Society of Architectural Engineers. Across, so t uh, TSU's architectural engineering program at that time was one of, the, one of uh, I want to say one of 13 accredited programs across the nation. Okay. Other ones were Penn State, University of Colorado, mm -hmm. California Polytechnical School, University of Texas. I could name all of them, you know, back then because I was active and president of the one here in Nashville. We hosted a conference for all those companies to come, all those schools to come to Nashville. It was a really great thing back in 1989. Even recently, looking at resumes of folks who were pursuing work here in town, TPAC, mm -hmm. and I saw resumes of architectural engineers from other places in leadership roles at these places with architectural engineers, the same degree that I have, and I realized that architectural engineers is, is creating leadership because we have to coordinate everybody, and it's a natural thing to, to be a leader, and I think... Uh, in the field of design and construction, architectural engineers definitely have the ability to, uh, to uh, lead. Kind of like uh, Jay-Z says something like, uh, you know, we're, we don't see us. You know what I'm right. saying? We, we're, you know, people want to be us, but we don't see us right. being a leader. And I right. think that architectural engineers, even though when they go get those no's from people, they don't see themselves as being in the leadership role because they give up. But I think if they... If you, you know, looking back, I'm like, wow, look at all these people in these different leaderships with AE degrees. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, that's what I think that AEs and people in my profession need to see themselves, is they can be genuinely be leaders because somebody's looking for somebody to coordinate all parts of construction. We bring them together. And that's yeah. one of the things you spoke on when we started the interview. You was able to bring people together exactly. and be able to work together. Exactly. So that's very important. It's not about being an expert. You know, we're architectural engineers can be experts in structural engineering and mm -hmm. illumination. You find a lot of them uh, have focuses in lighting and stuff, but a lot, most of us have to coordinate everybody. And right. so mechanical, they can just deliver the mechanical systems, the conveyors and all that focus on that. Electrical, of course, they just need to power up everything. Right. Architectural, have, we have to talk to all those people mm, and good. the client. So <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of work. Yeah. Well, I like to say, man, I thank you for coming by to my podcast, and uh, thank you for telling your story Appreciate and everything it. you've involved with. So now, when people they can attach a face to some of these places they see around the city, like the museum, Music City Center, Mount Zion Baptist Church, where a lot of people go to for service. So it's nice to see somebody that once again looks like us as a part of that and a part of history. So I just want to give you your flowers, man. All right. Uh, we're in a beautiful place as it is right here, right on Buchanan Street in the heart of North Nashville. So I know that's special for you too. Yes. To, be able to have a place to work out of here in the city where you grew up at. Yeah, thank you. All right. No KB, problem. I appreciate you and uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity. No problem, and, uh, sir. And good luck on your, on your podcast. Yes, sir. Let's make sure it grows to infinite degrees. Yes, sir. We'll do. All right. That's another episode of Live with KB. Catch us next time.